All right, everybody. So today we have Dr. Darren Kandau with us. How are you, man? Good. How are you? Doing well. Um, so as with all podcasts, I wanted to get this one started with the charity donation that I make and talking with Darren a little bit beforehand. Uh, we mentioned this one would go towards Operation Smile, uh, which again, for anybody who's new to the podcast, that is an organization that helps children born with cleft lip and palate and helps them get the reconstructive surgeries they need. Um, so yeah, as always, I'll have a link down below for anybody who wants to donate there as well. So Darren, um, as I mentioned, I had seen you on the Iron Culture podcast with Dr. Eric Helms and mm -hmm. Omar Isoff, and I almost didn't listen to it because I've been lifting for 15 years now, and I figured, you know, what am I going to learn that's new about creatine at this point? And obviously, there were things that I did know, but there were some things that I didn't. And, yeah. you know, you are certainly, I would say, an expert in that area, mm -hmm. and I've I was never somebody personally who was big into supplements. I think thankfully, even from a young age and getting into this at like 12 years old, I had some mentors in the area that kind of told me how, you know, supplements can help, but it's not this magic pill. And I was never somebody to just go and buy every new supplement that was on the shelf. Right. Um, however, creatine is pretty much one of the most studied supplements we have for this endeavor. Um, but there's also obviously other benefits than just hypertrophy, which we'll get into a little bit later on. Um, but just briefly, can you give people your background, um, your research background, and how you got into looking at creatine? Yeah, it's interesting. I did a, a cell biology degree at a university in Nova Scotia here in Canada. Uh, and then I went to the University of Saskatchewan. Uh, that's in the western uh, part of the country. And they were really big on bone research. They had these mm -hmm. longitudinal studies going on in the bone. So I, I uh, met a colleague, uh, Dr. Darren Burke. He's involved in uh, a lot of entrepreneurial uh, uh businesses and ventures right now and sustainability. But we got into some interesting um, um, research where I piggybacked with him and we started to look at ergogenic aids. And I was working out at the time and it's sort of everything clicked. I got to visualize exactly what was happening in the body. And we started to dabble in some amino acid protein and then the big one was creatine. So I did my master's on glutamine supplementation and resistance training. And then I sort of uh, helped uh, with many studies, uh, primarily protein and creatine and, and the creatine uh, results were so impressive uh, with hardly any side effects whatsoever, even with the loading phase at the time. Um, it sort of piggybacked my whole career path. Yeah. So I have to thank uh, Dr. Darren Burke, uh, especially, and uh, my mentor, Dr. Phil Chilibeck, for paving the way. And I actually tell all my students I lucked into it. I sort of just was at the right place at the right time and right. It sort of became a, a passion for me. And I think we've published now over 50 papers since on, on just creatine and looking at different age groups. And now we branch off into more clinical research. So, uh, um, yeah, the main focus, I would say 90% of my research is creatine and exercise yeah. on also hypertrophy, bone mass, but we still d uh, do some protein, caffeine uh, research as well. Uh, gotcha. So it's a, it's a variety of interests, but it's, it's getting more focused as we get more clinical. Right. And I, I noticed in the other podcast, you had mentioned how, you know, obviously there was the kind of joking debate between you and Eric on it being better than protein and, and yeah. all that. And I think um, for people who maybe, you know, don't know the ins and outs of that, can you explain, because obviously, you know, if you had somebody who took like eight, no protein at all, you're obviously not going to gain muscle, right? So I'm not sure if when you guys are talking, you're talking about a protein supplement compared to a creatine supplement, um, since, you know, maybe for the average person, if they're already eating a decent amount of protein. Um, you know, a protein powder might help a little bit, but not a ton versus what you can see in a relatively short period of time with creatine. So when we say, you know, it's better than protein, can you kind of elaborate on that? Yeah, that was me and him just going back and forth with Omar before. So protein and creatine are, are two of my favorites. I think for most uh, uh, would be uh, most people's favorites next to caffeine potentially. So protein is required. It's made up of 20 amino acids, uh, you know, uh, considering nine that are essential that drive muscle protein synthesis. So you have to be in a positive nitrogen balance, which means you have to have adequate amount of protein to build or sustain muscle mass. As we get older, we think that older individuals are not eating enough dietary protein. And it's embarrassing that the RDA is still 0 0.8 grams for an exercising right. individual. Stu Phillips has shown many times, as well as his graduate student at the time, Rob Morton, did an excellent meta-analysis that Eric was one of the, uh, the co-authors suggesting you know 1.2 to 2.2 could be a really good range with a, a wide range of confidence interval if you get 1.6 grams per kilogram that should be advantageous for an individual trying to improve muscle mass and strength um, and jose antonio from florida has shown even protein over 
two and even three grams per day can actually aid in fat loss, maybe based on satiety or thermogenic regulation. So protein is, is the main macronutrient that's required for protein synthesis and obviously uh, for muscle hypertrophy. Me and Eric were bantering because I always say creatine is better because when you look at all the meta-analysis, when you compare the, the amount of muscle accretion or hypertrophy from protein compared to creatine, creatine is superior and it obviously leads to a greater increase in strength and performance. Totally different pathways. Mm -hmm. Protein directly increases muscle protein synthesis from a tracer standpoint. Creatine doesn't, but creatine actually stimulates about eight or another other compounds that are directly involved in transcription and translation. So the theory is if you combine the two, and there's only been a couple studies, if you combine protein, and usually it's a whey-based protein or creatine, you may get a synergistic effect. The question I always have is what if you take a population that are on the RDA is 0.8 grams per kilogram of protein, or even in a deficit, can creatine overcome those deficits? Mm. And there is potential evidence when you look at the data that, especially in aging individuals, if they're at around 0.8 grams to 1.0 grams, creatine still can cause some beneficial effects. So if I was to rate the, the, the dietary supplements, not from a macronutrient perspective, creatine mm. will uh, be a protein supplement um, just based on the anabolic and anti-catabolic effects potentially. I'm a little bit more biased because I, uh, we do a lot of more creatine research but right. from a longevity perspective. Protein is crucial. I think creatine is something you would consider as the icing on the resistance training cake. That's another big important thing. Creatine can work but it really needs the stimuli from resistance training. Um, if you take right. creatine as a multivitamin, very minimally, there's about a handful of studies that show some potential benefits. But we really see in all the meta-analysis that creatine needs to be combined with some type of exercise, and that's typically uh, some type of resistance training, whereas protein has a number of benefits, even independent of exercise. Right, right. And just for the people listening, when you're talking about the 0.8 versus 2.2, you're talking sure. kilograms, right? Sorry, that's 0 0.8 grams per kilogram. And here in Canada, I usually recommend a gram per pound, the max. So if you're 200 pounds, if you're getting 200 grams of protein. That's phenomenal. You're going to have some going down the toilet. You can be rest assured that you're maximizing your rate of muscle protein synthesis. But of course, protein is used for so many things in the body besides muscle, blood, right. enzymes, bone tissue. Um, so there's always a benefit to having a surplus of protein. And I think that's what hopefully most people are trying to do. Now with the big range of ketogenic diets, there's going to be a question about, are you mm. getting enough protein to maintain muscle? Whereas if you're on a ketogenic diet or is your main goal to lose mass, how do you maintain muscle mass with that as well? So that's an interesting thing that long-term studies need to look at. Right. And so just for a real world example for people, you're saying maybe if the average person, like obviously probably almost everybody listening to this is right. probably taking a sufficient amount of protein in their diet. Mm -hmm. um, and, and probably a lot of people are taking creatine as well. But you're saying maybe if you took the average person just not really focusing much on their diet, right. they would probably see more benefits from, let's say, five grams of creatine per day compared to maybe one scoop of protein per day. Would that be like a reasonable example? Potentially, yeah. Like, it, it, So if, if you take the average North American who's sedentary, the 0 0.8 grams per kilogram of protein, which is just say if you're 70 kilograms, that's only 56 grams of protein a day. Right. That might be enough. 90% of the workplace is sedentary. They're not doing anything now with everything that's going on in the world where hopefully people are exercising at home, but probably they don't have the capability. So obviously there's a lot of issues going on. Um, but to get that much creatine that we've shown in research studies to be effective, it's really difficult through your diet. Mm. Like five right. grams of creatine powder would be about two steaks. Right. So to get that on a daily basis and uh, if you're a vegetarian or vegan, it's, mm. it's impossible. So there's different patterns of, and different uh, philosophies when it comes to protein which is found in, in some trace amounts of vegetables, obviously. But creatine is primarily only found in red meat, seafood, and poultry, or we're more familiar with the com commercial dietary supplement. Right. And, you know, as I was listening to the first half of that podcast, I was thinking, you know, because you're talking about all the great benefits of creatine. And, you know, I've been familiar with a lot of the benefits, but I always, you know, it would be a disconnect from my results because I had taken – you know, probably five to 10 brands of creatine monohydrate over the okay. years. And I never saw any benefit, you know, I, okay. but I had friends who would claim to that they'd gain a couple pounds and then, you know, but I have historically been not the best responder to uh, resistance training. I would okay. guess that I have a high preponderance of type one muscle fibers. And you, you started talking about non-responders and how they do mm -hmm. exist. And that you mentioned, um, I believe 
older people have a stronger response to creatine. Was that right? Yeah, we came up with a new study just last year, and we tried to look at all the variables that affect your response to the, the creatine. And I hear it all the time. Some people will take it, say they respond phenomenally well, and some people don't. So the first thing I tell them, you will know if you're a responder to creatine if you uh, induce water retention during the first week. Mm -hmm. So the whole theory with creatine, it increases cellular hydration to the body. The water retention is like blowing up a balloon, pitch your muscle. It's causing a whole bunch of things within the cell to be turned on, which potentially leads to an increase in muscle mass and strength. But the theory is when you say you might not re uh, respond well to creatine versus someone else, there's a couple things. Your initial fossil creatine levels in your muscle primarily dictate uh, your responsiveness. A lot of that is genetic. So it just depends on the level that you have. The other big one, as you just mentioned, type two muscle fibers. Those are the big powerful muscle fibers you use during explosive movements, uh, Olympic lifting, resistance training. The more type two larger muscle fibers you have in a greater quantity, creatine is primarily found there. So you're gonna respond more often as well. Third is your habitual dietary creatine intake. If you're on a high red meat, seafood or poultry diet, there's a good chance you're not gonna respond as nearly as well compared to a vegetarian or vegan. Uh, the fourth is sex. We've seen that some evidence to suggest that females actually are born or have higher initial creatine levels. Mm. And our ceiling seems to be about 160 to 170 millimoles per kilogram. So if you're already on a high meat diet or if you already have a higher initial amount, you're not going to respond as well. Whereas vegans typically have all the way down to 80. So they respond extremely well. And the fifth one is age. There's evidence that some older individuals have higher initial creatine levels or more specifically lower amounts in powerful muscles. So that's why we're starting to see some beneficial effects. So in summary, if you have a lower amount already in your body and you take a supplement, you're going to respond more. If you have a higher amount, you're going to respond uh, less. So in your case, you could be born with a certain uh, muscle fiber distribution. We'd have to look at your diet. And typically if you're on a red meat or seafood or nowadays a carnivore diet, mm -hmm. Those individuals would probably not respond from a muscle building perspective very well. But keep in mind to your viewers, emerging evidence is suggesting we only know the dosage and the amount to muscle. We have no clue when it comes to bone health or brain health. Right. And so I still tell uh, someone who's on a carnivore diet that creatine supplementation can still be effective for other things in the body. So there's about five things that dictate your responsiveness to creatine. Um, and that's why it's so multifactorial. Right. And, and I was going like through the list when you were talking, I was thinking, okay, well, you know, I'm younger, especially like when I first started taking it, um, I have a very high protein diet, um, mostly chicken, which I'm right. sure is lower, but still, you know, has it. Um, right. But yeah, I mean, for a decent portion of my life, I've had mm -hmm. a pound or more of chicken a day. Okay. Um, so, and then I, like I said, I believe probably more slow twitch muscle fibers just based on my uh, sports, like the sports that I've been good at versus not as good at and just my propensity of gain muscle. Um, so I was looking, I was like, yeah, that probably makes sense. And there's two ways I think you could think about it. Cause in one way, if you think about it based on like the muscle fibers, you might think, ah, crap, like I'm not growing cause I don't have a lot of type two muscle fibers. And also I don't respond to creatine. But the other way to think about it would be for a lot of people, like if your reserves are already higher, it's not that like you don't respond to creatine. It's more like you're already getting the benefit, right? right? Like it would be almost silly to say, like if vegans, for instance, have a better response to creatine, that doesn't mean, well, if you become a vegan, it'll be a better result. It's just like, no, they, they have a lower amount because of their diet. And they're just kind of catching up to somebody who already has that benefit from it, from the higher levels you know, naturally or through their diet. And that's 100% correct. Absolutely. And again, it, we're only focusing on performance. Uh, there's a lot of health aspects of when they say, what is the optimal dosage for bone or brain? Um, I'm not an expert in brain and creatine. I have other colleagues with that, but it really seems like the dosage of creatine to get across the, the blood brain barrier to be effective is way higher than a, mm -hmm. a dose that we would take from muscle. So there's a lot of different areas depending on why you're taking it. But the average, most people say I take five grams a day. We typically always base it on a relative standpoint, 0 0.1 gram per kilogram. Mm -hmm. We try to equate everybody across the board. But in general, five grams is more than enough to take on a daily basis uh, to be or to expect some beneficial effects somewhere, whatever you're trying to take. Yeah, that's one of the things I wanted to ask you about was the dosage, because as long as I can remember, I mean, it was always the five grams, right? Unless you wanted to do the loading week. Um, but then later, you know, I had to hear people talk about, yeah, even two and a half to three grams was sufficient. 
Yep. And that's kind of what I've heard up until your podcast. And you guys were talking about like 0.1. I was thinking, man, that would be for me about eight to nine grams of creatine right. per day, which yeah. is way higher than I've really ever heard. So you mentioned, is that specifically to get the other benefits besides like, do the muscular benefits seem to tap out at those lower doses? Yeah. So uh, we'll talk a little bit about the whole uh, um, confusion. So the best way to load the human skeletal muscle is the loading phase. You know, some people say take 20 grams a day for five to seven days, and that's phenomenally well. Roger Harris in 1992, probably one of the, the greatest creatine researchers of all time, showed very clearly that if you load the muscle, this is where all the supplement companies put on the label, they want you to take 20 grams a day, which is about 10 times as much as we're naturally making. We, we naturally synthesize about two grams a day. So take 10 times as much from a, a supplement. And this is independent of your normal uh, dietary intake. If you take 10 times as much, 20 grams a day for five to seven days, you will definitely saturate your muscle. But what we start to see is by day three, four, five, you're peeing out a lot of that creatine because your muscle's already full. And then when you look at the research, anytime you hear of these anecdotal side effects of creatine, like GI tract irritation, vomiting, um, diarrhea, nausea, it's typically always associated with the loading phase. And from a right. practical application standpoint, this is usually where you get the severe bloating or water retention. So a lot of our, our uh, initial studies, we would try to do a loading phase and people would withdraw. They say, you know, I gained seven pounds of water. I don't like it, especially young females. Very difficult to keep in a research study. And they're a population that's so underrepresented, just primarily due to the osmotic effects of creatine. So then we get into understanding the relative dosages. It's like giving uh, a 200 pound individual 80 milligrams of caffeine or an 80 kilogram some uh, individual 80 milligrams of caffeine, they may respond a different way. So we like to do the relative dosage of 0 0.1 grams per kilogram. And so that keeps everybody in a research study consistent, males or, or females. But you're totally right. Excellent research has suggested even as low as two to three grams a day is enough to maintain creatine stores once they're saturated. So if you start out with just two or three grams a day, it'll probably take you about 30 days to saturate your muscle. Mm -hmm. And if you maintain that dosage, you should still get some beneficial effects. And again, this is only talking about muscle. Right. You can also do the 20 grams a day for five to seven days and then reduce it down to two to three grams. And a lot of people will try that as well. So it really depends how, in a, how much of a rush you're trying to get into. We rarely do the loading phase. And especially if you're working with clinical populations, we just say 0 0.1 gram per kilogram. And we've shown it to be extremely effective. I'm starting to wonder as we get older, some of our studies are saying, geez, it, it, it looked like a trend to be effective, but maybe just like protein where you suffer anabolic resistance. Maybe as we get older, we don't respond as well to dietary creatine supplementation either. And we may have to do higher dosages. Hmm. That's an area that we're starting to look at. Maybe a higher dose of 10 to 15 grams a day in the aging body may be more required. We know you need almost double the amount of protein per meal in an older individual compared to a young. So that might be the exact same in creatine. So that's another avenue of area uh, that we're starting to look at. Do you take three to five grams a, a day <clears throat> on a daily basis? And that was in our International Society of Sport Nutrition Physician Stand. There, that's an a, a easy, effective way to achieve that um, once you've uh, saturated the, the muscle. So creatine can be taken every day. It can be taken on your training days. And there's actually no evidence to suggest you need to cycle creatine. You've given creatine on a daily basis for two years in postmenopausal females, no adverse effects to liver, kidney, or blood. So we see no detrimental effects of continually taking creatine. Again, to reiterate, that's based on muscle. We're not mm -hmm. sure how this affects bone, other tissues, or uh, cognition and brain health. Did I see, I feel like I saw a study, maybe it was just speculation, that there might have even been some minor benefits to the kidneys from creatine that like they expected it to be harmful and then it actually ended up being maybe a little beneficial. Yeah. There was a new study last year suggesting if you have impaired kidney function, creatine seems to be an essential nutrient to overcome that. Oh. So, I mean, the, we're going to, we're actually, there's a group of us writing a paper now on dispelling the myths of creatine. I'm not good evidence to suggest that creatine causes baldness and a lot of other researchers the same way, <laughs> but there's about 10 myths that just drive us uh, really bad or, or irritated when we hear, a lot of speculation with it. So we're writing a, a pretty good review paper on some of the myths, but it has no effect compared to placebo. So there's a, a distinction when you do a research study, especially, especially a randomized control trial. If you have a placebo, creatine usually will always cause some type of, of side effect in someone because you're taking a, an exogenous supplement. 
but compared to placebo, we don't see any greater effects on the liver mm -hmm. or kidney. Uh, we actually don't see any greater effects in individuals with or on the cardiovascular system um, or other abnormalities. And the times you hear muscle cramping, dehydration, things like that, they're very anecdotal, excessively high dose, usually during uh, the loading phase. So right now, I consider creating the safest, most effective dietary supplement when it comes to muscle and, and muscle performance perspective. I know you're joking there about the, the balding, but yeah. I have heard and I've even <clears throat> had questions from clients about, you know, if it's going <clears> to <throat> accelerate their balding. And mm -hmm. um, I have, that's not something I've looked much into other than it actually seems like there's maybe some <clears throat> relation to DHT, but maybe that's yep. one of the myths. Could you maybe It was the one on study that? in the rugby players who took creatine. I believe there was a loading phase as well. And DHT just was upregulated. But just because you increase a hormone doesn't necessarily translate into the, the end product. It's no different than turning on protein synthesis if it doesn't lead to a, a, an increase in protein. So right. the analogy is like, oh, if you do a snapshot that something increased protein synthesis doesn't lead to hypertrophy, not necessarily. Right. And so that one study is still used. And of course you would have to look at individuals long-term to see the effects and then look at different uh, causes right. of uh, hair loss uh, over time. But yeah, I'm not the the best person to yeah, talk right. about it obviously every time I look in the mirror. So it's that's fine. Okay. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I save um, money on haircuts, you know. Is there is uh, any other studies looking at DHT and that or and showing that there was no change, or that's the only one that's looked at? That's it? the only one I'm aware of. That was an experimental trial compared to huh. placebo, and I have to think there's other labs out there because it's such a popular topic, and we consider it a myth. And that is actually one of the myths that we're actually yeah. uh, uh, targeting. Uh, Dr. Tim uh, Ziegenfuss is going to handle that when we look at hormones and alopecia and baldness with creatine. And let's just decipher the, the myth and is there evidence to suggest, well, if a hormone's turned on, it's no different than if I take uh, creatine and I increase or, or decrease myostatin, mm -hmm. uh, a protein that inhibits muscle growth. Does that mean I'm going to get like 350 pounds of muscle? Absolutely not. So there's right. a disconnect between what's out there from the myth versus uh, the documented evidence. Yeah, it's interesting that it isn't, like you said, it, it's a somewhat popular topic. I've seen it mm -hmm. pop up with how many creatine studies there are. I'm surprised it's not. And it's also, I mean, you know, measuring DHT, you know, just a little blood work wouldn't be terribly hard to do. I'm right. surprised that it hasn't been uh, replicated. Yeah. The only way to do it is you actually have to measure hair loss right. and do that over time. And then you have to extrapolate what's actually causing it. So then you get got to get into genomic sequencing Right. Eternal X, Y. So there's so many variables. You would have to look at a long-term study of individuals who had what they considered, and you'd have to define a full head of hair, divide them up into creatine and placebo. And maybe you'd have to look at a 10, 20, 30 year longitudinal study and ask them right. what happened over time. And it, so that's more epidemiological. So uh, I think when it comes to creatine, most people want an acute uh, right. result to get the results out there. So that's one of those things over time. Yeah. Are there any other hormones that we find upregulated in response to creatine? There's many that are potentially uh, growth factors we see more often than not. So insulin like mm -hmm. growth factor one seems to be increased the mRNA expression and the protein content. And the nice thing about that is uh, insulin like growth factor stimulates bone accretion, but it also stimulates muscle protein synthesis through the mTOR pathway. So that's one right. of the main ways we think creatine can help build muscle. Uh, and the other big one is it seems to decrease myostatin. So myostatin is an inhibitory growth factor. You see pictures on uh, TV of animals that seem extremely muscular. Right. They've just basically blocked or downregulated this uh, uh, growth factor, a protein. So we think in animal uh, 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 studies that creatine decreases myostatin, it turns on insulin-like growth factors. So those are two, two of the potential uh, explanations why creatine may cause an increase in muscle mass and or uh, recovery. Gotcha. Yeah, it's just me thinking out loud here. It's interesting that you were talking about how just because you see one thing doesn't necessarily mean it correlates to something else. Right. And I think when it comes to DHT and hair loss, that's a reasonable connection. I mean, we, we do often see that. That's why something like finasteride could be pre um, prescribed to people who don't want hair loss, which lowers DHT. Yeah. Uh, but you know, you were mentioning uh, protein there and protein does tend to increase um, IGF-1 right and mm -hmm. stimulate the mTOR pathway and there's some research showing that when you decrease IGF-1 and the mTOR pathway in animals it extends their lifespan and yet Correct. we don't see that low protein intake correlates with increased lifespan so mm -hmm. just you know there can be theories and a 
of bioplausibility doesn't necessarily mean that that's the actual outcome. Yep. And it's extremely confusing. If you're on social media, Twitter, things like that, one study will come out and then 10 minutes later, it's someone arguing that they have data in mice or, or other rodent models. And so the extrapolation from rodent to human and then mm -hmm. different age groups of humans is very difficult. Uh, just because you read one study, you got to be very careful on where it's been and the dosage and extrapolation. So absolutely, you can't, the correlation, a lot of people want the cause and effect. And in science, it just never usually happens until you do hundreds and hundreds of studies that come up right. with a general uh, hypothesis or conclusion. And then that obviously changes with the new landmark studies. Yeah. And it's tough because I just saw, uh, <laughs> I, I won't call out the specific names, but I saw um, a an influencer with a PhD who is, I would say, reasonably intelligent and um, does his research kind of stomping on this girl who posted up how uh, there was a new study that showed just getting rid of one cup of milk a day reduced breast cancer by like 50% or something. And, and so okay. she, yeah. And, and so she, you know, puts this out there and is like, you know, what a simple way to reduce my breast cancer risk by 50%. Mm. And then all these comments are like, Oh good, I'm going to stop drinking milk. And it's like, right. man, like I understand you're trying to like get science out there, you know, yep. but that, you just clearly don't understand the process. And that's, yeah. I think could be dangerous because there's going to be, I mean, there's meta analyses contradicting that. And it's just, I mean, obviously you have a, a very um, in-depth research background. Mm. So, you know, I'm preaching to the choir with, for, <laughs> to you, but it's just, it's interesting to see it on social media where you get yeah. just enough knowledge to be problematic. I think at times it, it's, uh, it's, it's uh, as an academic, it's extremely uh, ironic and frustrating. So we do all the work. We spend hundreds of thousands. We do all the work. And, and a lot of people don't know. It takes thousands of hours. You do all the work yep. and you, you publish a paper. Sometimes it can take a year to publish a paper and you put it out and you put it on PubMed and maybe 20 people read it. Whereas someone <laughs> that's non-academic on social media can have hundreds and hundreds of thousands of followers and they all twist it or whichever. And then people believe it. Yeah. So the, the power of social media is phenomenal. I might have two followers and be considered a top creatine researcher, whereas Joe Blow can have a million followers because they yeah. put out little workout videos or, or whichever, and they might be uh, sending mixed or incorrect messages. But yeah. then you have a million people follow that, whereas you might get two people listen to me. So it's, to it's ironic that we're the ones that typically do the work, yeah. but everybody else gets the credit, and that's just the way society is. There's yeah. nothing wrong with that. But sometimes the message they send is incorrect. And then you just feel like, oh my God, you're going to, what if you hurt someone? Yeah. What if you put out incorrect information? So it, it's a, it's a slippery uh, uh, slope. It's a double-edged sword, but it's always you're funny. Being that, too nice by saying there's nothing wrong with it. I think there is something oh, wrong with yeah. It. <laughs> it, it. Yeah. And it's also, if you publish a thesis and you put a hundred dollar bill in the cover, you go back to the library 10 years later, the hundred dollar bill is still there because we're only so in depth on <laughs> online. Right. And so, you know, it takes us a year or so to publish a paper. We post it on Instagram and most people don't follow boring people like me. They just like, Hey, I'm more into uh, well-known celebrities or, yeah. uh, or, or influencers, as you say. So they're the ones who take it and they get all the press, but the person who did all the work yeah. uh, is, is left. And I'm totally fine with it because you know, it's, it's just a, a, an area that I'm not uh, very good at. Right. Uh, you try to pr promote uh, information, but I marvel at people with millions of followers and, and then you look at their background and they just have made a self career of taking other people's work yeah. and making it fancy and people follow that and, and good for them. It's just, I just don't know how to do it. And I'm much more comfortable in a lab and, and writing boring journal articles that people don't understand the words. And right. they basically say, I don't understand anything you're talking about because in science <laughs> papers is boring. We don't speak uh, in lay terms what's the take home message and you tell the influencer and they take the take home message and they put it on social media and, and they're more famous for it. So at the end I of it, I think it's, yeah, it's good to have a middle ground. I mean, I just had actually um, Dr. Stu Phillips on yeah. uh, last week along with Dr. Lane Norton. I had them together and I think it's nice. I mean, Stu is definitely a much more prolific researcher than Lane, but Lane at least has the background and he gets it out there totally. in a way that, I can appreciate, you know, it's like he's got the social media flair and everything, yeah. but he's still, he's getting, I think, mostly the right messages out there. And mm -hmm. Stu is, again, kind of a good middle ground. But something I brought up to them is that, you know, my mentor in, during my bachelor's, you know, I did 
a small amount of research under him. Yeah. Um, but Dr. Nicholas Radimus, if, if you know yeah. the name and In New Jersey. Yeah. 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 So, um, and it's funny cause <laughs> Lane was saying how he always has to call his, uh, his, I guess, mentor, Dr. Layman instead of Don. And that's kind of how I feel. Like I've actually hung out with Nick, but it still feels weird to call him Nick instead of Dr. Radimus. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> but, yeah. but he's done a ton of studies, right? I mean, yep. he's, he's yep. prolific and he's now the editor in chief for um, Journal of Strength and Conditioning. Correct. And yep. I, I did have him on the podcast, but it was just not what he normally does, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, he is used to being in a, a room as a professor and sure. an academic. And it's probably like, I mean, he's, we've talked about it. It's probably frustrating to have all the experience. And, and I don't know if you've ever met him, but he's a very big guy. I mean, he's an experienced yep. lifter mm-hmm. and yep. to have somebody just on social media parroting some nonsense. And it's, mm-hmm. it's gotta be very frustrating after decades of work to see that. And yeah. it's just like, <laughs> you know, what is this? Yeah. It's, it's, it's funny. Like Stu and I, I know Stu well, uh, he's in the top three protein researchers in the world. Yeah. Uh, Bob Wolf, Ernie Parano, Stu Phillips, Luke Van Loon, there's a Kevin Tipton. There's these guys have paved the way for everything we know on protein. One of those uh, individuals has, le- uh, has led to that. So they do all the work and Lane is a phenomenal researcher as well. I- I've met him. Uh, and then he has a really phenomenal social platform. So those guys have a really cool niche of, of yeah. getting science. So those two individuals you brought up are phenomenal because they actually have the credentials to back it. They do the work and have done the work. And they continue to do the work. Um, and it is nice to get the information out there uh, uh, through those uh, avenues. So it's, 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 uh, it's always humbling. Uh, sometimes the only time an academic ever gets any attention is at a conference. And mm-hmm. because the people who are at a conference are typically in that area. Right. This power of Twitter and, and Instagram and Facebook, it's just quite phenomenal because it's global. And yeah, um, right. it's an interesting way to go for sure. Yeah, Definitely. Uh, you had mentioned that we found that there's not really a need to cycle, that it, it's safe long term. I had <clears> thought <throat> that I had heard you mention the other podcast, which kind of surprised me, um, that there might be some utility in cycling. And I'm not remembering exactly why right. you would mention that. Maybe you can elaborate. Yeah. So the theory with this is that when you take in exogenous creatine through uh, uh, food or supplementation, you downregulate acutely your endogenous production. So it, when we eat food products, uh, uh, creatine is basically arginine, glycine, and methionine. So three amino acids come together in the kidney and liver to produce creatine. And we use that to maintain ATP levels and other things in the body. But when you take in a uh, supplementation form, you may downregulate your natural production because you're taking it in, you're compensating for it. It's no different than a type 1 diabetic taking in exogenous insulin. There's no need to produce it naturally, or that's why they're taking it in. So uh, about that would have been in the infancy about 20 years ago where individuals were thinking, God, if you take a supplement, you're going to kill your natural production. You're going to mm-hmm. destroy your natural uh, transporter. But the evidence, as soon as you stop taking it, um, your natural production, if it was ever affected, comes back up. And we actually don't see any evidence that it downregulates it uh, substantially over time. And the nice thing is by taking creatine in for maybe four, six or eight weeks, you're uh, – creatine levels, if you will, in the muscle are elevated for at least 28 days after you stop taking it. So some people say, oh my God, if I stop taking creatine, I'm going to deflate. I'm going to lose all those gains. Well, not necessarily. If you continue to train, you should at least maintain those gains because it takes about 28 days to come back to baseline. So if that's the case, that's where this, excuse me, four week uh, loading phase uh, uh, was uh, speculated. People would take creatine for an extended period of time. They would stop taking it because they thought, oh, now when I take it again, I'll get this extra boost Mm. until a study comes out where they look at a group that cycles creatine for an extended period of time versus continuous. And we're trying to get this uh, study up and running. There's no evidence to suggest you do need to cycle it or that cycling is any better than continuous daily intake on an extended period of time. The difficulty with coming up to that conclusion you would have to get a study where an individual would take creatine 20 grams a day for five days, stop taking it for 28 days or a placebo, and then switch back compared to a same amount. So it's a long-term study. You'd probably have to design it for a full year, and you also need to get a placebo group in there. So it's, a, it's just a daunting task to come up uh, right. with the cycling and why it lasts so long in the body. If it was a caffeine study, we could do it crossover in 48 hours with creatine takes about 28 days and you need to do biopsies to uh, differentiate mm. it. So 
we can only generally conclude there's no difference, but right now there's no evidence to suggest, hey, you lose the benefits after 28 days. We've seen benefits uh, multiple testing times up to two years. Gotcha. So would there be any benefit? You mentioned that the way you'll know if you're a responder is if you have a couple pounds of weight gain within the first week or so. Um, I guess first question is, would that be in response to normal doses of about five grams? And then secondly, would there be any use in saying like, okay, I really just want to find out if I'm a responder or not. So therefore, even though the loading phase isn't going to be long-term beneficial, it's mm -hmm. going to give me the best chance of determining if there's any effect. Like, would you say that yeah. makes sense for an individual trying to determine that? Yes, two good questions there. So one, I should, I should have clarified, one of the ways to determine if you're responsive, if you put on water retention, but a lot of people that don't uh, actually get an increase in uh, body weight in the first week still respond, mm -hmm. either increase in strength, endurance, or even potentially muscle mass. So there's other ways to say uh, respond. Most people can't go in and get a muscle biopsy or some labs don't have a spectrometry, so they can't measure how much initial creatine you have. And unless you actually do a test to determine your fast twitch or uh, type two muscle fibers and slow twitch, and you can actually do this indirectly through a, a mechanical uh, isokinetic machine in a lab, a lot of people don't have access to that. So some of the ways to say that if you're responding or not is you may try the loading phase and see if you get some beneficial effects. What you should expect is that you're actually increasing your ability to resistance train longer, more intense, or have accelerated recovery. And I think one of the well-documented things with creatine is you do put on muscle mass, but that could take six, eight, 10 weeks to notice a change over time. But we get immediate increases in neuromuscular activation that leads to an increase in strength. So if you notice that you're getting potentially stronger, there's a good chance that creatine is increasing high energy phosphate metabolism, allowing you to exercise at a greater training capacity. So although creatine was uh, discovered in the 1800s, athletes for the Barcelona Olympics in 92 started to uh, see or use creatine as a training aid to increase the volume of resistance training and or exercise volume they're doing. So a lot of people say, when I take creatine, I feel like I can exercise longer or frequent. But we think one of the biggest mechanisms with creatine is this anti-catabolic. It speeds up your recovery from exercise, allowing you to exercise more frequently. So sometimes some people say I have too much muscle soreness or I just don't feel like I can exercise at the highest level. We see that creatine decreases protein breakdown and specifically inflammation. And so if the muscle is more in a, a healthier environment, uh, it can actually recover and maybe allow that athlete or exercising individual to recover more. Interesting. Um, you mentioned the decreased inflammation. Is that specifically uh, inflammation seen muscularly, or is there any measure of systemic inflammation with creatine? We see acute systemic inflammation, but the only times that it's been shown is not with resistance training, actually. It's been long-term aerobic uh, exercise. So the two studies we're looking at in uh, individuals that were trained, uh, Ironman or triathlon, and before running the race or are participating in the event, the individuals loaded with creatine for five days. And when they looked at cytokines after like tumor necrosis factor or interleukin-6 indicators of inflammation, the creatine group, although both had uh, an increase post-exercise, obviously that makes sense, three, four, multiple hours of exercise, the increase in creatine was substantially reduced. That would potentially allow those individuals to get back and start training for the next subsequent bout. The increased in inflammation? <laughs> Yeah, or sorry, creatine really decreased the rate of inflammation. Gotcha. Okay. Um, but ironically, in, the, in one of our studies or papers in 2019, we didn't see a decrease in inflammation from resistance training. Hmm. And the theory is maybe resistance training is not inflammatory enough. It's intermittent. So if you do aerobic exercise, it's continuous. You're probably uh, producing more uh, free radicals, reactive right. oxidative species. The longer uh, aerobic exercise goes, maybe it's more catabolic to the muscle. Whereas resistance training, maybe eight seconds of work, two minutes of rest, eight seconds of work, two minutes of rest. So the theory is that maybe creatine doesn't increase inflammation during acute resistance training sessions, just because that session may not be catabolic enough to the body to increase inflammatory markers. That's really There's interesting. Way, way more studies need to be done. There's only been a few that have looked at it. Yeah. I mean, I, you know, talking with people who have inflammatory conditions, sometimes mm -hmm. if they do too much aerobic activity, their condition will flare up. Um, I wonder if creatine would, you know, benefit. I mean, it sounds like it, it certainly would benefit them at least to some degree. In the studies that have shown the creatine to be sort of an anti-inflammatory, mm 
they've been in aerobic based exercise settings. Uh, the only thing that creatine has been shown to reduce with resistance training is creatine kinase, which is obviously increased during muscle damage anyway. Sure. So but when you look at the systemic inflammatory markers, we think resistance training is just too acute per session. But if you take an Olympic athlete, maybe train two, three times a day, maybe it would help. Right. But for the average person, we barely have enough time to do a 45 minute workout session. Right. So I don't think creatine would decrease inflammatory markers with resistance training. But if you say, I'm going to go train for a marathon and you're out running hours a day, it potentially would. Cause that uh, a form of exercise is so catabolic to the whole body could have a detriment or creatine could have a beneficial effect from a recovery agent. Have you noticed that people have a difference in response over time? Or, I mean, this would have to be anecdotal. You, you probably couldn't study this too well, but um, the reason I ask is, is just, it's interesting. I've been dieting since about February. And okay. of course the first 10 pounds is, is the easiest. And I expected kind of a stall, but what happened is I like right around yeah, but right after 10 pounds or so, it was just like, man, like I just went from one to two pounds a week to like nothing. Okay. And then I listened to your podcast mm -hmm. and I was thinking like, I've never noticed any response to creatine, okay. but I really did seem to just stop losing. Like right when I started taking, it, I had like checked my order history of when I got it and everything. And then I remember being surprised because I was in my basement working out since all the gyms are closed. And I, despite eating like quite low calories, my strength was good. Like I was like, man, I'm either maintaining or gaining a little bit of strength, mm -hmm. eating like 1800 calories a day. So I'm like, am I even in a deficit right now? Like what is going on? Right. And I was thinking like, maybe if, if, if I gained one to two pounds of water weight and I had a response to creatine, that mm -hmm. would explain a lack of dropping weight and a lack of drop in strength while dieting. Um, but again, I just never noticed anything previous to that. So I don't know yep. if Heard of that. That's a, that's, that makes total sense, right? Like if you're retaining water in the cell, even if you're on a reduced calorie diet, and typically when you're redi uh, dieting, you're reducing cal or, uh, calories from carbohydrate. Every gram of carbohydrate, you trap about three grams of water in the muscle. Right. So therefore, if you're having a reduction in calories, you're inevitably reducing uh, or decreasing water uh, consumption. Creatine would help maintain or trap some of that in the body. So there, that could offset uh, uh, some of the, the, the decreases in body weight for sure. Yeah. So creatine actually increases neuromuscular activation uh, from Parkinson's disease to the healthy individual. So one of the biggest uh, effects of creatine is an increase in, in strength. And there's some evidence to suggest muscle and endurance and power. So it could help maintain um, uh, muscular strength over time. And it would be a great study to look at individuals in a hypocaloric state mm -hmm. and give them creatine versus placebo. Can creatine overcome the detrimental effects of a diet? I know when uh, Eric was in Canada doing he his presentation was on the, the craziness of, of getting ready for a bodybuilding competition. Yeah. And, and it was just ironic and eye opening how hard it is and how dedicated those individuals are to get ready to go on stage and the reduction in calories and how they feel and lethargic and, and maybe creatine is something that can help. But the problem for a bodybuilder is if, and I've never done this, obviously, and I have no genetics, uh, but if, I, if creatine traps water, that's probably the last thing a bodybuilder would want before they go on stage because they're trying to look as vascular as possible. So a lot of uh, off-the-cuff conversations, bodybuilders will stop creatine six weeks out just to reduce uh, the chance of trapping water in the body. So it really comes down to what you're trying to achieve. Counter argument to that is, one of the biggest myths with creatine is that it dehydrates the body. Well, I say, no, you're getting it wrong. It must hyperhydrate the body because you're trapping water in there. Right. The only time you suffer muscle cramps or, or some things you hear from uh, hot environments, it could be dehydration in general, or it could be that you've taken too much creatine that it could be causing too much swelling. Yeah. So there's a, a little bit of a misnomer with that as well. Wouldn't the, isn't the, the water gain intramuscular though? Some is extracellular in the body, but okay. the whole the purpose here is through an osmotic gradient that creatine increases intracellular water, which for a long time, a lot of people thought, oh, you're just uh, increasing water in the muscle, so it's not really uh, uh, lean tissue. There's good evidence to suggest, no, you get an increase in dry lean tissue mass as well through muscle fiber uh, biopsies as well as other technologies. So it does help stimulate uh, some of the effects, but it does lead to an increased net dry water or dry muscle retention.
Okay. But you're saying there is actually some extracellular fluid retention as well. Then You would naturally have a little bit of edema when you're coming in, but again, it takes a long time to get it into the cell. It's not instantaneously. Mm -hmm. So that's why we usually recommend individuals to drink four to six extra glass of water during a research study. Just make sure you're hydrated. Cause a lot of times some people would say, Hey, I took in too much water and now I'm excreting a lot, but we want to make sure you're in a hypohydrated state. Does that balance out over time that you get back to a norm, like a normal extracellular fluid level? Yeah, most people, when you ask them, they say, hey, I, went, I didn't notice the water retention after about 10 days. Mm. The problem with a lot of experimental studies, we typically measure the body mass pre and then after. Very little do we measure it on a week by week basis. Right. But anecdotally, most people say, hey, it sort of lasted in me five days. It lasted in me 10 days. The issues with young females during the menstrual cycle, they're going to have their menstrual cycle and then some of the effects of creatine. So that usually expands some of the effects. And I think that's one of the main reasons a lot of young females uh, are premenopausal and, and before withdraw from studies. They just don't like the effect of the water retention. Um, and it's, a, it's unfortunately, it's a hugely underrepresented population. I'm more interested in young females for the bone uh, potential because the correlation is that uh, young females may uh, be more prone to osteoporosis later in life. And if creatine can actually increase not only muscle mass, but bone mass at an earlier stage, that might offset some of the osteopenia or osteoporotic uh, detriments when they go through menopause and then, of course, postmenopause. Gotcha. Gotcha. So, um, you know, you obviously discussed some of the like, not just muscular benefits there. That might right. be a good way to, to wrap up is we, we kind of hinted towards some of the benefits. Could you maybe elaborate a little bit on if somebody's saying, okay, I take three grams a day, I get mm -hmm. the benefits, but this guy is telling me to take eight grams a day. We've discussed how that three to five grams is probably all you would need for the muscular benefits. So, and, and I don't even know if you'd really be able to feel, of course, these extra benefits, but what could, what does the literature indicate might happen if we start bumping up to higher doses? Yeah. So the only thing we notice with higher doses is you might get a slightly greater beneficial effect depending on the size of the person. Um, unfortunately right now, when it comes to bone health, there's the studies that have used really low doses, the one to two to three grams, when they're not combined with resistance training, there's no effect even over a year on, mm. on bone mass. But when we do higher dosages, it seems to be an effect. And it makes sense about 95% of your creatine is taken into muscle. So you have a minimal amount going in your brain, testes and, and bone. Maybe you need a little bit higher dosage there when it comes to brain health. Uh, hardly any studies have looked at it, but all the consensus is that a higher dose is required to potentially have an effect just because it causes, or you need so much more creatine to get in the brain. And the other thing with the brain is it actually produces its own creatine. The skeletal mm. muscle doesn't. So the brain is already synthesizing creatine itself. You're going to need a lot more to get that, that boost. Uh, but in, in general, three to five grams a day is an easy way if you have a supplement container or if you look at the back of, of any type of uh, uh, food label product, have an estimation, salmon steak, a, a regular size serving of uh, red meat, probably give you two to three grams of creatine. If you're taking that per day, you should get some effects. All our studies suggest that you need more. So that's why supplementation has been used in every single one of our studies. We haven't relied on food. And, and uh, on average, five grams a day is probably about the average amount that's shown to be effective. If you're in a disease state population, aging, you may need a bit more, but until we do those dosing studies, which we're in the midst of doing right now, we haven't determined the optimal dosage, but it's in general. Gotcha. So just as a practical takeaway, it sounds like almost everybody would benefit from a few grams per day. Mm -hmm. um, and likely there are some potential benefits if you're bumping it up to about 0.1, uh, what was it, 0.1 milligrams per Put one gram per kilogram. kilogram. Yeah. So yes. if you're 70 kilograms, that's seven grams a day, which right. is not that much more. But if people say, geez, I fluctuate weight a lot, uh, what's an easy thing to do? Uh, three to five grams is typically what we would recommend from an absolute dosage. Um, so they're all really uh, roughly the same. Awesome. Well, again, thank you so much for talking to us today, man. My pleasure. Um, I know you said you're not big on Instagram, but I know you do have an Instagram. So do, yeah. <laughs> where can people find that or anything else you're putting out? Yeah, on Instagram, uh, just Dr. Darren Candle. You search me. Uh, if you want to follow me, we post a lot of things on um, uh, creatine or other research. We've got some upcoming uh, things with the International Society of Sport Nutrition. Uh, you can search for me on Facebook or Twitter. And uh, thanks for having me. Awesome. Thanks so much. Man. Awesome.